All right. He is the creative director at Callahan Creek in Kansas City and the author of Chasing the Monster Idea. Second. Don't touch that. Do you want it as a souvenir? <laughs> What's going on? Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! Hey, that was me. All right. Well, thanks for coming out. You know, one of the things uh, I've done here in the last couple of days, I've done a lot of uh, workshops with you guys and seen how, well, frankly, how utterly twisted most of you are um, as we start getting in, generating some ideas. Uh, but also how many stories you guys tell. And I love listening as people come in and sit down at a table full of arts and crafts materials and the stories that they end up telling each other. Um, you know, story is such a, an important part of the way that we communicate. So to start us off, I'm going to tell you a story. And we're going to get a little into sort of a fantasy world. So let me set the setting for this. The year is, oh, you see that? The year is 2602. And we have found a way to travel into space and colonize other planets as the human race. And we have found out that we are not alone in the universe, that there are other alien races out there. And they are pissed at us because we do what we do, which is colonize planets, take over their worlds. And we find out that these aliens, they are very large, and they are very scary, and they have got advanced technology, and they don't like us. So we engage in intergalactic war with these aliens, and we have engaged in two battles with these aliens, and despite being outmanned and outgunned, we found a way to survive. But now we get word that they're coming for us. They, they are coming to Earth. And they're not only going to decimate Earth, they're going to decimate everything because they have this weapon that takes out solar systems. And they're coming and they're bringing the battle to us. And we are, again, outmanned. And we are outgunned. And they have got advanced technology. And the odds of us surviving this battle are incredibly poor. Now, we do have one thing in our favor. We've got our fearless leader. Not Obama, but he's a fearless leader. This is 2602. He's not around anymore. 2602. We have a fearless leader. He's a cybergenetic super soldier known only as Master Chief. <laughs> the people who are snickering right now are video game geeks, just so you know. Now, Master Chief leads us into battle. And sacrifices everything, and we manage to win this battle. And as the human race is known to do, we build memorials to Master Chief, museums to the battle, to celebrate his bravery and leading us through this war. Now, obviously, what I've explained to you is not a movie plot or a book piece of science fiction. It's the setup to a video game, Halo 3. Now, what makes this video game relevant to us in the advertising industry is that the campaign for this video game represents a fundamental shift that's happened in our industry that few people have recognized. And this particular campaign happens to provide all of the elements to represent this fundamental shift. This campaign for this video game started with live action trailers, real people in costume, filmed during this supposed battle, which doesn't sound all of that amazing yet. This happened about nine months out of the, the release of the game. And then this incredibly complex alternate reality game called Iris started, which was telling the story between the end of Halo 2 and the beginning of Halo 3. 
and it had planted websites, and it had bits and pieces. This is going to be fun. Bits and pieces of bits and pieces of um, ads in in um, uh, retailer magazines and retailer newspaper ads with codes that you would plug in to IP addresses and get certain bits and pieces of information. And then a series of videos started coming out. And these videos came out online. And they were set in the future, after the war, some 50 years after the war, with supposed soldiers who had grown old coming back to the Museum of Humanity to explain the bravery of Master Chief to a documentary film crew who was documenting this particular battle. They would go out to the battlefields and they would show what happened in those moments. There was one where a soldier went out, he's 70 years old, doc, took the documentary crew out to this area, this kind of opening in the field, and uh, had some lights that were there to show it. It was at nighttime. And he was explaining that they had to spend, him and his whole platoon had to spend the whole night bunkered down in this ditch while the enemy stood above them. And they had to stay in complete silence because they were out of ammunition. And they had to wait until morning, until Master Chief got there to save them. And they couldn't make a sound or else the enemy would decimate them. And they stood in complete silence for hours, just waiting to be found out in the complete darkness. And you hear the documentary film crew director say, can we turn the lights out to see how dark it was? And he hesitates. And he says, sure. And they turn the lights out, and it's pitch black. And all you hear is a, just a real faint whimper, just a little one. The exact type of reaction that you would have if this battle had actually taken place. So the campaign continues forth. They built a 1,400 square foot diorama of a particular moment in this battle. And they wanted it to be so accurate that they went back and they studied photos of war to see what the expression on the faces of the soldiers were to make sure that they had everything as perfect as it would actually be in this moment of war. Now, you may wonder, why would they build a 1,400-square-foot diorama? Well, they had two purposes for it. The first was, on the website, they provided a fly-through. So you could take, take a, a camera down through this and stop and look around at this battle. And you found certain things out if you were part of this game uh, from, the, from the inception. You saw weapons that you had never seen before. You saw areas of the battlefield that, that could help you in the game. But we're beginning to fill in the story of what's been taking place between Halo 2 and Halo 3. But then the second thing that they used this diorama for was for the only TV spot they ran. And they ran it one time. It wasn't on the Super Bowl. They ran it, I think it was Everybody Loves Raymond or something. They ran it one time. And those of you in media know how much it costs to run one spot one time. But that's all they did. The rest of this was done completely and fully online. And here was the spot. Not a second of gameplay, and not a word of dialogue. And I want you to remember who the audience for this is. 12 to 23-year-old boys, men. And you're going to put in a spot that has no gameplay and not a word of dialogue and tells a very advanced story. 
on everybody. It, I, I may be wrong on the everybody will ever throw him in, but it, would, it ran just once, right? So you've got, you've got a very interesting direction that they've taken. Ad agency was given a $40 million budget on this campaign. It's a video game to 12-year-olds. What this campaign represents is a shift in our industry, a shift in the very purpose of the creative that we generate every day. To understand this shift, it's important that we understand what creativity really is. And that's, if there's been any uh, theme to this the last couple of days with the workshops that I've done and, and today, it should be this, that creativity isn't, it isn't a mystical force. It isn't something that, that shows up out of nowhere that we don't control. Creativity is problem solving. And it's done so with novelty and relevance. Those are the two pieces you need to be creative. You need to understand that because this shift in, in the purpose of advertising creative that this, that this particular campaign represents, it, it, it's built around this paradigm alteration that the audience for this particular campaign being 12 to 23 year old boys, that they participate in an action that most of us participate in, but it is, no, it, is, it, is a, um, uh, it is media to them. It's how they consume. And it's very important to understand it. Advertising had always historically put product as hero. That we lifted up the product and we told of its benefit. And we said, isn't this a wonderful product? Let me tell you about it and you will see exactly why it is so great. Every ad we create has a photo of the product and a bullet list of all the things that it does. But in the context of this shift that we're seeing, it is no longer about product as hero, but it's about consumer as hero. It is no longer about what the product does. It's about what the product makes you believe. It's about how the product makes you feel. When Apple shows you FaceTime, they don't show you how many pixels or in the resolution. They show a, a, a expectant mother announcing that she's pregnant to her husband because that's how it makes you feel. It has nothing to do with what the product does. That's implied. We use rational purchase drivers in order to do this. Product and price. Here's what the product does. Here's how much it costs. Those are rational purchase drivers. That used to be the foundation of everything we as advertisers did. We would put up a product and we would tell about its price. And that was it. But it is no longer enough. Rational purchase drivers are now the cost of entry in our market. To be successful, we now have to find out what the emotional purchase drivers are. What is the experience that this product provides in addition to what it is, in addition to what it does? How will this product make someone feel? What's the equity of the brand behind this product? Is it a brand that I can trust? That stuff never used to matter. The product was everything. Now it does. Advertising's purpose from 100 years ago had always been about memory. How do I make my product, or how, as an advertiser, how do I make this product memorable? We would use reach and frequency to do this. We would use jingles, things that were catchy, things that people would help them remember. We would use bright colors and try to own color schemes so that when they saw it on the shelf, they remembered. It was about memory because you were going to get a marketing message and then at some point when you were going to make that buy decision, we needed you to remember us. So we hit with as much media as we possibly could with the catchiest jingle that you couldn't get out of your hands. Da 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 da. I'm loving it. So when you get hungry, you go da 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 da. I'm going to go to McDonald's. It's about memory. But see, then something happened. As the influx of, of media channels increased, we as advertisers could no longer wait for the consumer to make a buy decision. They were getting too many messages in between. So now it became about influence. We had to incite them to go buy it right now. It was about urgency. Sale, buy now. Buy one, get one free. Half off, today only. It's about urgency. We have to influence the buy decision because we can't take the chance that you would get our, our message and then something else would get inserted in between. 
So we had to influence the buy decision. But see, as we're seeing in the context of this shift in our industry, these things no longer matter. So the problem that we have historically solved as advertisers is how to make more consumers. That's our goal. Our clients pay us an ungodly amount of money to make more consumers for them. And we use a variety of media outlets in which to do so and a variety of messages in which to do so. But it's to make more consumers. The problem is that that's no longer the goal. And very few agencies are picking up on it. And we're starting to see some agencies make marks. We're starting to see campaigns like the most interesting man in the world or the man your man could smell like or going back 15 years ago, BMW Films. We're beginning to see agencies understand this paradigm shift. It is no longer about how do we make more consumers. It's now how do we make more evangelists. Consumerism is now attached to evangelism, and it never used to be the case. The consumer has a power that they never had, and we as advertisers can no longer ignore it. If you had a bad brand experience as a consumer, say you went to Cracker Barrel. You have Cracker Barrel here? There's Cracker Barrel everywhere, isn't there? Say you went to Cracker Barrel and you had a bad, uh, some bad green beans. You used to go home and go, dude, never go to Cracker Barrel. Oh, God, I feel awful. And, every, and you and your 10 friends would go, yeah, dude, I'm never going back to Cracker Barrel. And you know what Cracker Barrel would say? Who cares? 10 of you. It's not going to make or break our business with 10 of you. You can scream all you want. Now, the average Facebook user has 190 friends. Now, don't feel bad if you don't have 190 friends. <laughs> You're incredibly average to me. <laughs> average Facebook user has 190 friends. If you post something and those 190 friends repost it and their 190 friends repost it, 6.9 million people. Two generations of posts. Consumer has a power they never had. Ask Netflix what happens when you alter your service and don't ask permission. Remember what Netflix did, Netflix went from an insane bargain to a really good deal. And people freaked. And they said, we're going to jump ship. And Netflix says, we dare you. And then they did. And then they went, we're just kidding. <laughs> well, we'll back it up. Ask Bank of America what happens when you raise the ATM fee by $1. And someone says, we're going we're gonna to go to credit unions. And Bank of America goes, we've heard that before. Everyone says it. Credit union day. No, buy no gas day. We've all had those days, right? Well, all of a sudden she posts it and it goes whoop, 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 6.9 million people on Bank of America. It's like, just kidding. We were just testing. It's okay. Chick-fil-A Chick day. Right? The consumer has a power they never had. And it works the other way as well. If you're Domino's and you go, we got crappy pizza and we can do one of two things. We can either keep pretending that we're really not crappy pizza or we can own this and then spread that message. And so Domino's has completely reversed their fortune based on the fact that consumers have a power they never had before. And that power is social. This is only really in the last 10 years that this has happened. It's no longer about making consumers. You have to create evangelists. And when you do, advertising has turned human. Media are now people. And until we as advertisers bank on that and start understanding that we have got to create content that people will share or else our message will never get out. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember, not last Super Bowl, Super Bowl before, the Darth Vader Volkswagen spot? How many of you saw it online? How many of you saw it before it aired on the Super Bowl? 34 million people saw that spot before it ever aired on TV one time. 34 million people. It's gotten 85 million views on YouTube. I want you to think about that dynamic. If you buy media in here, I want you to think about that dynamic. 
Because it is, it is about evangelism. How do we spread a message? How do people find out about our product? Advertising used to be about information. You didn't know about a product unless advertising told you about it, unless you saw an ad. It's incredible what's happened. So we have to look at that and say, well, what do I do now? How do I, how do I create something that people will share? We can no longer bank on memory. We can no longer bank on influence. We have to bank on something else. We have to generate curiosity. Because curiosity is one of the most compelling emotions known to man, and it is an emotion. There's something interesting about humans. The greatest fear people have is of the unknown. We can deal with anything we can see. If you walk into a, a room and it is completely pitch black and you can't see anything and you hear something growl, you're going to freak. But walk into a lit room and see a raccoon in the corner growling, and you're like, <clears throat> of course, until it jumps you around your face and just starts gnawing away. It's the unknown that we're afraid of. We have to know. So when our curiosity is peaked, we have to find out the answers. And we as brand managers, as advertisers, if we can pique a consumer's curiosity and then pay off that curiosity with a positive brand experience, People will share it. And when they share it, and then their friends see it, and their friends share it, all of a sudden we're starting to see numbers that we had to previously buy. It was the only way that we could get it. Now if we create genuine content, we can get it and we can get it for nothing. That's a huge paradigm shift. How many of us are taking advantage of that? That's what a monster idea is. It's an idea that has created evangelists that people have shared. And we're starting to see them in greater influx. How many of you have played the Terry Crews music? Have you seen that yet? The Old Spice, the next Old Spice thing, where you play the music right there, right? I want you to think about that for a second, too. There's a video on Vimeo for Old Spice. And it's Terry Crews, the, the big muscly guy. And he's got all these connectors connected to his body. And he flexes his pecs. And music plays, like a drum plays. It's all connected. So you're watching this video, you're watching a video on Vimeo, okay? It's a video. A video is a one-way interaction. I'm watching it. And then at the end of the video, it says, hey, you can play now too. And you start hitting your keyboard and you're playing the video. Like you're controlling which pecs move and which things move around. In the video, on Vimeo. <laughs> It's remarkable. Like the interaction that happens there is incredible. And what's happened? Boom, 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 boom. It's had like 70 million views. It's only been out for a week and a half. Again, those people who are in media understand what 70 million views would cost you. And it's not just the view, it's the type of view. There was a um, study done by the Harvard Review two years ago on consumerism. And two very significant things came out of this study. The first one was that 14% of people admitted that they had purchased a product solely on advertising. They had, they had no other interaction. They saw an ad, they bought the product. 14% of people admitted that. The second statistic that came out of that was 92% of people admitted that they had purchased a product on the recommendation of a friend only. No other influence. 92%. We as advertisers have been spending millions of dollars in the last 100 years trying to take that 14% to 18% and calling that success. And there's 92% sitting right there. How do we get their friends to tell them about the product? We do it online and we do it with social media. When a friend says you should check this out and you like that friend's sense of humor, you probably have a good idea of what that's going to be and you're probably already going to be predisposed to like it because they like it. That's an incredibly powerful emotion as an advertiser to use. If you have a friend who you trust has said, you should look at this, this is good. How do we get more of that? So I started looking into these ideas, these campaigns that seem to have found an evangelistic core to see if I could get anything out of them. Because as an advertiser, as a creative, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what the model for this type of monster idea really is. 
And so as I started studying them, I found seven characteristics. We're going to go through these characteristics very quickly. And we're going to look at examples of these seven characteristics of monster ideas. Now the reason why I wrote the book and the reason why I'm talking to you today is that these seven characteristics represent something that you can filter your own ideas through. We've all had ideas where we go, I think this is a great idea. But how big of an idea might it actually be? Right? It, it, we're comparing it to other ideas we've generated, to other ideas that we're seeing around our agency or around our area. How big of an idea really is this? Well, here you've got a couple of characteristics that you can filter it through to see if it has what it takes to be a monster idea. See if it has what it takes to build evangelists. So let's go through them. I said very quickly, seven characteristics of monster ideas. First, is it emotional? Now we as advertisers have no problem using positive emotions. We like to make people laugh because it's really hard to, to hate something that you're laughing at. I guess. <laughs> Entirely sure why we turn to humor so often. But there are a bevy of emotions that we could be attaching our product to. Remember, it's about the emotional purchase drivers now. So how is that product supposed to make you feel? You know, there's a great bit on Mad Men where, where uh, Don Draper is, is um, pitching an idea for the, the carousel, the Kodak carousel, if you've seen that. And he has pictures of his family at a time when he's going through a lot of turmoil in his family. And he's explaining that this isn't, a, that this isn't a, a slide projector, that it's a carousel, and that it goes back and forward the way that a child thinks about going back and forward. And he finishes it, and it was a very emotional thing. Like one of the guys runs out because he's crying. And, and he finishes it, and, and I can't remember the other guy's name. He turns to the two, the two clients who were in for the pitch, and he goes, good luck at your next meeting. It's like, good luck finding something more authentic than that. Right? Emotion is a very powerful thing, but it doesn't always have to be humor. Gatorade had a very interesting problem. Gatorade wanted to extend their sales, and they recognized that their core audience is under 30 years old. Why? Because under 30 years old are athletes, typically. So if they want to get people 30 years and above to drink more Gatorade, they have a very big problem. People over 30 don't exercise regularly. Seven out of 10 admit that they don't exercise regularly. If you don't exercise regularly, you're probably not drinking Gatorade. It's not the type of thing that you order at a bar. So how does Gatorade get more men over 30 to drink Gatorade? They invented Replay. And it started off as a campaign, and it's got much bigger. And this is what Replay was. Welcome to the 87th meeting between the State Liners of Phillipsburg and the Red Rovers of Easton. A 27-yard field goal attempt. It's blocked! The whistle has blown! This one is over! A sister kisser! Time might be worse than a loss. We think we have a score to settle. Gatorade has chosen to team up with the towns of Phillipsburg, New Jersey, and Easton. We're inviting the guys from the 93 team to strap on the helmet and the shoulder pads and replay that game to determine the true champion once and for all. I said to Coach, we're going to kind of come out and sweat and warm up, and he said, no, we go full pads every day. And I'm like, Coach, we're in our 30s. <laughs> come on now. My first thought was, who are the crazies that are going to suit it up and try and play football? We shouldn't be doing this. 15 years away from the game, you're just not going to be able to get that kind of finesse in a day. Your eyes are, are certainly showing concussion. A lot of people out there saying you can't do it. Let's prove them wrong. One, two, three, two! 10,000 tickets sold out in 90 minutes. The field temperature right now is at 100 degrees. They looked at your age and they said, you can't do it. They didn't look at your heart. They said to look inside of you. Get the astronaut and play the damn game. No matter how old you are, 8 to 80, blind, crippled, or crazy, you're always an athlete. Damn straight, let's go. I got about 10 different teams that I played against that I'd like another shot at. Blind, crippled, or crazy, you're always an athlete. Most guys, when they were under 30, played something. And they knew that if they could make them believe it again, give them something real, something authentic that was in them, that they would take it up again. Now, I don't know if they'd go so far as to take up football again, but that they would re-engage with an active lifestyle. And they were absolutely right. Quadrupled Gatorade sales in that market in four months. 
That's, for those of you who are in the business long enough to know what quadrupled in a market means, is ridiculous. <laughs> how successful it is. It was so successful, Fox Sports has picked it up. It's still running. It's in its fourth season. And every, every season, they find two teams that play two sports of some form. It's not always football. And they pit them up against each other. And they follow both teams in their training all the way up to the game, which is always the final episode. It's awesome. And every time I see an episode, I go to the gym. <laughs> it works. Are the ideas that we're generating emotional? Do they, do they touch on something authentic to the audience that we know? Something that's real to them? If we do, we have a chance for a monster idea. Number two, is it experiential? We seem to think that everything is experiential, that we can put up a website and that's experiential. It's not. Experiential is something that saturates you, that meets you where you weren't expecting. And we've had opportunities to see that sometimes, when we've walked into some place that's branded, that we didn't expect it to be and go, oh, that's really smart. I hadn't thought about that. Are we bringing our message to people? Or are we expecting them to come to us? Really great ideas, monster ideas, meet people where they're at. I'll give you an example, Domino's Pizza. Now, Domino's Pizza here, we, are, we already know their struggles here. But in Europe, Domino's Pizza isn't struggling at all. See, in Europe, it's actually rare to have delivery pizza. And the way that Domino's makes pizza is an American way of making pizza. And that's, it's just fairly unique. There aren't that many doing it. So Domino's wants to extend their, uh, their delivery reach. And in order to do that, they have to get people to understand that they can order pizza not just at home and not just at work. Those are the two places most people order pizza at home and at work. They want them to know that within their, their delivery radius, they'll deliver pizza anywhere. It doesn't have to be home or work. It could be anywhere as long as you're within the circle. So they created the Domino's doors. And they placed them, this is in Amsterdam, they placed them around the areas, parks, beaches, any place. You can call that number and Domino's will deliver you a pizza. And they'll come up to the door and they'll ring the doorbell. <laughs> pizza. Close the door. But they, they want you to understand that you can, you can deliver anywhere. So if you were on the beach, even if you didn't have, want a pizza, and you were on the beach and you saw that door, what would you do? Look what I just found at the beach. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, yeah. Crazy. The whole campaign was built around novelty. And it gets the point across in a really unique way. And their profits soared. What kind of experiences are we bringing to our consumer? Or are we expecting them to love our product and our message so much that they'll seek us out with every ounce of breath they have in their body. Look at our own behavior. We don't seek much out anymore. Brand evangelism is incredibly difficult. There are very few brands that we are passionate about, so much so that we'll buy whatever. For me, I hate to say it, I'm just a fanboy with Apple. The iPad was a perfect example. Apple released the iPad and everyone went, what am I going to use that for? And then they started buying it. They invented a market because people were fans of Apple, and I'll buy that product. That happens incredibly rare in our lives. And yet we as advertisers often think, well, if I just tell them how great this product is, they'll take it, because it's awesome. Well, that doesn't work anymore. What are we bringing to consumers? What kind of experiences are we creating? Number three, is it entertaining? Advertising has had no problem being entertaining. We like to think of ourselves as kind of, as kind of low budget entertainers to begin with. Humor is a huge way we do this. Ask any, see any beer ad, it's always about humor, right? We have no problem being entertaining that way. But I want you to think about your own behavior again. When you share something, what do you typically share? If it's a video, you're sharing entertainment. Very rarely do you ever go, hey, check out the ad for the uh, car dealer down the street, the guy that's talking about the deals. Check this out. <laughs> we don't share that because it's not entertaining. We don't want to attach ourselves to that. We shared the Volkswagen Darth Vader spot because it was entertaining. That's why we shared it. So when we as advertisers create content for our clients, are we thinking about how they share, about what they would share, about the entertainment value within that? Because if it's not entertaining, I don't care how great a deal it is, no one's sharing it. This is what I drive. 
I drive a Jeep Wrangler. I have since college. I love my Jeep Wrangler. It is, to some degree, one of the few brands that I actually do consume to the level of brand evangelism. When I got married, two years after I got married, my wife says, I'm pregnant. And the first thing I thought of is, oh my god, I have to get rid of the Jeep. <laughs> and I'm going to have to get a minivan. Because this is what I thought a minivan looked like. And this is the, like, I'm not thinking about fatherhood and throwing a ball and growing. I'm thinking, my god, my Jeep. <laughs> and Toyota knows that's how young parents think. So when they want to sell you a Sienna, they don't want to sell you a minivan. They want to sell you a swagger wagon. <laughs> they create a series of spots around a couple of Second Cities, Second City uh, actors, about what a young parent would think around a minivan. Frankly, the idea of owning a minivan used to make me cry myself to sleep at night. But I gotta say, my Sienna is great. It's super stylish. Oh, and the available Dual View Entertainment Center? Awesome. Hold on, I just finished episode eight. Oh boy, if I wasn't married. <laughs> I tell my husband, the more time I spend in it, the less stressed I feel, and the fewer headaches I get. <laughs> Honey, mommy's having a time out, okay? Meet the family and the new Sienna on YouTube. Toyota whole series of spots on YouTube, just like it. Different features. The only criticism I have is with the word stylish. No one ever, if you're a writer in this room, never use the word stylish. It has no meaning. We don't know what stylish means. So stop using stylish. But outside of that, very funny. And there's a whole bunch of spots that really relate of the dad taking the kid to the park, talking about how cool it is to, to drive the Sienna and how unique it is and how much it represents his style as a dad and then seeing one of his friends who had bought a Sienna too, and getting all pissed because he, 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 he bogarted his style and couldn't get a style of his own and packs up his kid's stuff and gets all mad and leaves. It's, they're hilarious. What are we doing to create content that's entertaining for our clients? What are we doing to take their messaging, authentic messaging, and turning it into something people will share? Our own behavior is a perfect opportunity to this. Go back, now that you have timeline, you can go back and look at all the things that you shared. And I guarantee you, most of the things that you shared, 99% of the things you shared, you shared because they were entertaining. That's how we share. So when we create content for our clients, why do we back away from that? Mostly because our clients go, I don't want you to make fun of this, or I don't want you to be funny. They found a way to be authentic in what they did. We should too. Number four. Is it novel? Novelty has been the hallmark of creativity since the inception of time. How different or unique an idea is, is how we designate it, whether or not it's creative. When we think of an app idea, which we all have, thought up an app idea, and we go, oh, what if, what if we use the camera and use it as a magnifying glass so you could read it? And then you go online and you go, oh, there's 27 other apps that do the exact same thing. <laughs> oh, it must not be a good idea. Screw it. I'm going to go someplace else. We looked at the fact that it wasn't different as why it wasn't a good idea. The reality was it was a good idea. So good that 27 other people have done it. Novelty is the hallmark of creativity. If we want our ideas to be noticed, we have to have some level of novelty in them. But we get this misconception that novelty means completely 100% different. The reality is we as a society don't like this much change. This different is, is hard for us to consume. They've had the technology for electronic cars for years, and they haven't put them out because it's too big of a change in our society. They have to put them out in little bits and pieces. Sometimes little novelty is all it really takes. If you do something just slightly different, if you use something that people normally associate with your brand or product, and then you just twist it a little bit, it's enough to get noticed. This is Sweden. And outside of looking oddly phallic, Sweden's known for a few things. One of them is wonderful chocolate. But if I say Sweden and brand, what do you think of? Thank you. you th Volvo's one of them. Right? Volvo always comes up. You think of Ikea. I think of Ikea. Now, Ikeas are in Sweden. They're like Starbucks here. They're on every corner. Cities will have two and three and four Ikeas. How many Ikeas do you need? They have so many Ikeas. So if you're Malmo, 
and you're this guy. And you're opening up an Ikea, and there are two Ikeas within 20 miles of you. And you're opening up a new Ikea. How are you going to generate business? This is Gordon Gustafson. Gordon's a real dude. He's the general manager of Ikea. And he goes to Ikea, who usually does all of their own corporate advertising, and says, can I do my own stuff? And they say, well, no. But you can, you can take $10,000 and do something. So he goes to an Oslo-based uh, digital firm and says, I got 10 grand. What can you do for me? And they say, well, we'll put up a Facebook page. And everyone's like, oh, Gordon, you could have done that yourself, dude. You saved yourself 10 grand. <laughs> but Gordon's not done yet. They put up a photo gallery. Ah, oh, wow, still not that novel. Lots of photo galleries. If you know Ikea, they put them, they, they have all their furniture in rooms, right? So you can see what it looks like. Until you recognize that whenever Gordon puts a photo up of a room from Ikea, the first people to tag the items in it get it for free. Ooh. Something you see every day just twisted just this much. He goes from zero fans to 25,000 fans in four days. And every time he puts up a photo, it gets tagged. Now, I've never fully understood this. Because if you think about the model, you, you're going to share, hey, you should friend this because, or you should become a fan of this because then if you tag it, aren't you bringing more competitors into this? Like, wouldn't you want to keep that secret? Didn't work out that way. Everyone was saying, look how cool this is. Check this out. And all of a sudden, Gordon's off and running. Just a small twist to something we already see. Now, Facebook had to pull it all down because anything that's truly unique, Facebook has to pull down. <laughs> Can't tag things with your names that aren't you. So, but it's up for a week, and that's all he needed. Small twists. So we can't use that now? No, you can't use that. Well, hold on. <laughs> give, me, give, me, give me a couple of minutes. I'll think of something. Yeah. Let's not think of massive change. Let's think of small change. What can we do in the context of the media that we have and just turn it a little bit so that people notice it? Just small changes can create monster ideas. Is it authentic? Advertisers, mostly the creative side, I will fully admit because I'm on that side. I'll, say it, I'll even say it that way. Most creatives are willing to sacrifice authenticity for novelty. We would rather it be different or beautiful than authentic. And this is where we have to we have to turn that gene off. Authenticity in advertising is everything. People will sniff out inauthentic like you wouldn't believe. And now all the things that you, we used to be able to say just wash over people. You know, lowest prices, best service. How many of us have written that in an ad? It doesn't mean anything. It, it, we can't prove any of it. And we've become numb to those terms, even if they're true. Authenticity is one of those things that, that we rarely think about. Because in advertising, we're given to exaggeration. That's what we do. It's what we try to be noticed. This is the greatest thing you've ever seen. It's pretty fun. It's decent. But it's not the greatest thing you've ever seen. But we're in advertising, so we have to blow everything out. We have to exaggerate. But what we're finding is people who are being authentic, Domino's being a good example, are getting noticed because of that authenticity, because of that transparency. See, authenticity is a lot like this. Everything's fantastic in the foreground. And then grandma in the background is <laughs> taking a face punch. <laughs> we skin what people see wonderfully. A touching moment between a young couple. And mom's got her nose on the cement. <laughs> because it's inauthentic. Our message isn't real, but we frame it to be. Now, authenticity is usually best seen when it's not there, when we see examples that aren't real. Sony had some problems a while back when they, were, uh, they had fake blogs out of, of video gamers who were talking great about uh, the, the, the PlayStation. And come to find out, they, were, they worked at Sony. And they found that out. And then, all of, of course, what happens happens. Oh, this is all fake, and Sony's trying to play you, and the whole thing happens, right? Because when, when, when authenticity is not there is when we most see it. 
So if you're a brand like McDonald's, you do so much advertising, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make some bad calls. So McDonald's does what, what any brand would do, which is if we want to reach a particular market, how do we reach them? Well, let's use the language of that market. So if you want to reach, say, young urban youth, it seems like a good idea to use the lingo. But it rarely ever really is. So you come out with banner ads that say, double cheeseburger, I'd hit it, I'm a dollar menu guy. Until you find out that in the very language that you're trying to use, you're implying that this nice young man would have a sexual encounter with a double cheeseburger. <laughs> Which very well may be the case, but I'm not sure it's going to sell more cheeseburgers. And he's looking so longingly at it too, isn't he? How are you doing? Two patties, huh? You look good, girl. I just see the guys in the white ivory tower. Oh, that's hip. Run that. That's good looking stuff. Let's go. Clearly inauthentic. Clearly salesy. And frankly, we do it all the time. Maybe not that, to that extent, but we do it all the time. If we are going to generate monster ideas, they have to be authentic. They've got to be real. And we as creatives have to stop trading novelty for authenticity. It's better to be authentic and not as beautiful than to be inauthentic and artistically wonderful. And we need to get out of that habit. That's how you create monster ideas. Number six, is it based in story? Story is the most fundamentally sound communication vehicle known to man. It's the strongest vehicle we have to communicate. We communicate to each other through story throughout our entire day. When we don't understand a concept, we ask somebody to give us an example. When we talk about how we felt over the course of lunch, we talk about it in the context of what happened. We tell stories. We're all storytellers. We go to the movies because we love stories. We read books because we love stories. And then as soon as we get into advertising, we stop telling stories. And I don't understand it. <laughs> we fall right out of the, the, the most advanced, most compelling communication vehicle ever because we think that it takes too long to tell story. And it doesn't. We can tell a story in a picture. There was a great shot. I don't have it up here. I should, I should have brought it. There was a great, uh, I think it was for the Paralympics where it was, uh, it was a, a two-page spread of, of a guy who got into an accident. And it's like the ambulance, and then the stretcher, and then, and then it's a physical therapy, and then, or it's his amputation, and the physical therapy, and then you know, him, him like sweating through weights, and then him running, walking, and then him running, and then him entering the Paralympics. And it's all in the context of one two-page spread, and it is a compelling, strong story. Story is, is so compelling that we've completely left it on the table as advertisers. And there's an opportunity for us to do so much more. The things that we share, they're story-based. We can tell stories in a minute that other advertisers have been trying to tell over the course of their entire existence. And I'll give you an example. Virgin Mobile is not that uh, big over here. I think Sprint owns Virgin Mobile over here. But in Europe, Virgin Mobile is very big. And if you're Virgin Mobile and you're selling a product that everyone else sells, we see it every time when we see a cell phone ad. It's like, OK, it's the Galaxy S2. It goes online. It checks email. It's got a great picture. It does what every other product does. Slight variations, but if you have no differentiating factor, what do you do? You can stand up and you can hold the product up and you can put bullets next to it. You can say what a wonderful product it is. This is fantastic. It's got all this resolution or you can choose to tell a story.
that phone doesn't play movies, it doesn't play music, it doesn't play games. That phone transforms a subway ride home that's usually very dull into something else. How does that make you feel, is what they're saying. They told a story in a minute. Most of the time when we choose not to tell stories, it's because we don't think we have time. I've only got one page. I've only got a brochure. I've only got, I've got this front page of this website. That's all I've got. But the reality is we're choosing not to tell story because story is difficult. But if story can help us sell many more products for our clients, why do we ignore it? Story is one of the most fundamental uh, characteristics of monster ideas and something that I think advertising could take a, um, a heavy hit in in uh, our ability to tell great stories. Number seven, is it scary? Monster ideas are scary because they're monsters, because there's an inherent risk with them. And it's scary to generate them, it's scary to share them, it's scary to pitch them, it's scary to put them in the world because you have no idea if they're gonna work. There is no ROI model for some of these ideas. There was nothing that Wyden Kennedy could show Old Spice and say, if we get Terry Crews to flex his pec muscles to music, we'll sell more Old Spice. There, was, there is no model for it, which is what makes it so scary. So monsters or ideas are gonna be scary. There was a, a great ad man who once said that a really great idea makes everyone in the room just a little bit uncomfortable. Just a little. Clients, creatives, account, everyone. Just a little uncomfortable. If the ideas that you're generating are not scary to you, then there's no chance of them to be a monster idea. Because if they're not scary to you, that means that you've got an example already of what that idea can do, and then you know exactly how it's going to perform. McCann World Group knows a thing or two about scary ideas. McCann World Group is one of the largest ad agencies in the world. And they had their largest client come to them and say, here's what we're gonna do you have um, performed for us well in these last two campaigns you ran for us. We're gonna give you the largest budget we've ever given you. Don't screw it up. So they start in the ideation process. What are we gonna do with this campaign? They've got two models in place already working. Safe models to take. Two junior designers throw out an idea and the CD's like, crap, that's really good. Now what do we do? Because I was perfectly fine taking the model that we knew was gonna work. And now I've gotta think about this. And I want you to think about what, what you would do in that situation. Would you take the safe model that you know? Or would you take a flyer on something unusual? McCann takes the flyer. And instead of putting pictures of their product in their ads, they built a 1,400 square foot plastic model for Halo 3. $170 million in its first day. One day, it's a video game. $300 million in its first week. There are 99% of, of films don't make $300 million. Five films a year for their entire lifetime. More than a million people played it in the first 20 hours it was around. This is my favorite stat. 27% drop in movie attendance on the weekend it launched. <laughs> From the previous year, and I went back and looked at the movies, and every time I'm gonna get up and do this talk, I keep thinking I need to, I need to bring the list of movies. They weren't duds. They, it wasn't a completely blank weekend. There was something in there. It was a Jennifer Lopez movie or something. It was in there. It was a decent movie. It wasn't all crap. The goal was to sell 1.5 million copies. If they sell 1.5 million copies of Halo 3, they're the best-selling game franchise of all time, and it's the best-selling game of all time. If they can sell 1.5 million copies, in the first three months, they sold 8.1 million copies of a video game. What I read here is that they understand this fundamental shift, that they created content that was evangelistic, they couldn't get those numbers if people didn't talk about them because frankly, they really didn't advertise. There wasn't a lot of media out there for it. They ran one spot one time. One spot one time, 8.1 million copies. All in the power of the consumer. What I also read out of this is that there has never in the history of this industry been a better time to be a creative. 
Because the two things that, that usually were obstacles to creatives, to creating really great ideas and getting them out there in the public were technology and distribution and clients. But you could generate anything now. You could make it yourself. I've seen amazing things done on, on iPhones from a video standpoint. You could put out content. Distribution is no longer an obstacle. The only obstacle is the idea and how monstrous it really is. So for you students coming into this industry, you're coming in at the exact right time. But you have a chance to do something that we didn't do. You have a chance to come in and not just follow our footsteps, but erase them and do something else. Create monster ideas. <laughs>